Hi, Jeffrey Craner here. This episode of Within the Wires is brought to you by Fox Searchlight's new movie, The Shape of Water. From visionary filmmaker Guillermo del Toro, it's a stunning and beautiful cinematic vision, and you need to see this in an actual cinema. So don't miss The Shape of Water, now playing in select theaters. This episode is also brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash WTW. Finally, we have Within the Wires shirts and posters for all your holiday gift-giving needs. Go to withinthewires.com for more. And now, an audio guide of the Ohara Museum of Art, 1980. Hello, I am curator Ria Akane, welcoming you to the Ohara Museum of Art and our special exhibit of the work of the late Claudia Artiano. Toward the end of Artiano's life, it was suggested by friends that she was working toward more epic depictions. But as those works are unfinished or perhaps not begun, we have but her more intimate concepts. In this exhibit, we will see some of Atiano's more political tributes to classic works, which were lost in the Great Reckoning. We also have the rarely displayed attentiveness, which I feel has been an underrated part of Atiano's catalogue. Narrating your audio guide is journalist, artist, and dear friend of Artiano, Roy Mata Mangakahia. We are blessed to have Mangakahia's knowledge not only of Artiano as an artist, but as a person. While not nearly as successful as her late friend, Mangakahia has been an invaluable champion of Artiano's work, perhaps as important to Artiano's popularity as Artiano's own talent. We hope you find deeper understanding and appreciation for Artiano's work, a life in art sadly cut short. The exhibit begins in the main gallery. Artworks included in the audio guide are numbered. Enjoy your time at the Ohara Museum of Art. 1. Stars Little remains of Impressionist Vincent van Gogh's work. There are a handful of photographs of Starry Night, and a portion of what remains of the painting hangs in Manhattan's Museum of Modern Art, its new Harlem Island structure, a masterpiece of modern architecture. Many works of the European masters were lost in the Great Reckoning. Many works by artists worldwide were lost, but at the center of Western art history were the Impressionists. Starry Night, Monet's Olympia, Cezanne's The Card Players. These paintings are often recreated by artists in our new society, an exercise in cultural reclamation, of course, an attempt to return to the knowledge and art and history that was lost after the war. But with stars, Artiano took this replication trend in a new direction, a direction that rejected recreating what was lost. In fact, Artiano's replicas were more reappropriations of classic images. In her way, Artiano was rejecting a return to the past and embracing the society, albeit the society she wanted, not the society that was. From the moment I first met Claudia in 1970, she was obsessed with replications. In stars, she takes the stylized swirls and moist twinkling glimmer of twilight and brings all of its vibrant motion to a halt. The irony of Artiano's version of stars is its complete lack of stars. The black sky looms above a charcoal city at night, mostly war-scarred and evacuated, or worse, eradicated. The stars likely shine and soar behind the choking clouds, 
unaware and unobserved. What we see is merely a moon struggling to be seen in a humid black haze above the town. Notice, in the centre of her painting, the church spire. Broken. The rising hills along the right, rocky and charred. The homes, dim and roofless. There are large spirals of smoke mirroring Van Gogh's inspired blue swirls, but in Atiano's stars we see only variations of grey. The one contrast in her bleak landscape is the tall flames in the foreground on the left. Did you ever go to church? What is a spire? Did God do this to us? If so... Who's God? Some critics refer to this as a fire representing the destruction of the reckoning, but I believe that Atiano was attempting to evoke a bonfire, a possible celebration by the townspeople in the universe of her painting, a communal fire to burn old art, books, clothes and doctrines of the tribes which led the world to such destruction. The art of war, obviously, paintings and written accounts of war heroes as we know now that war holds no place for heroes. All themes of national superiority were turned one by one to ash. Underneath the bleak sky we have a fire of a new day, of a new people wishing to rid themselves of the baggage of their past, the treachery of nation states and family. It's a brilliant work and perfect approach to artistic repurposing. It's difficult to say when repurposing becomes just a copy or plagiarism. Sometimes even the artist doesn't know where to draw the line. Two, attentiveness. Many critics claim Atiano's attentiveness is her most garish work, noting its bold, almost clumsy strokes and its unsubtle praise of her own fame and wealth. I don't disagree with them, but I would hate to completely dismiss this work simply for its lack of tact and technique. While Latiano never stated directly that it was a self-portrait, it's easy to place her as the woman central to this painting. Her narrow shoulders and short stature contrasted against long, dark, braided hair. The woman is exiting a luxury automobile, her head turned from the viewer, and a woman on the other side of the open car door taking a camera from her bag. Look at the photographer's mouth, agape, caught in a moment of surprise and awe at this chance encounter with a celebrity. Have you ever seen a celebrity? <laughs> Were you this obvious about it? Are you impressed by luxury automobiles? Do you wear driving gloves? While she often bemoaned the loss of her anonymity and, by extension, a freedom of self, Atiano most certainly relished the attention her career provided her. She would shower, dress, put on makeup, take off makeup, undress, shower again, and repeat the process for two hours before a gallery opening. She always dressed fashionably, but at private parties or events, she carried herself casually and comfortably. She did not like photographs, only compliments. She grew bored with conversations that did not acknowledge her talents, at least occasionally. I had many conversations with Claudia that acknowledged her talents, as I urged her to focus on larger projects, pieces that could continue to impact the art world, as she slipped further and further into lazy drawings of discarded papers and staplers and weak forgeries disguised as tributes. I told her about her incredible talents and she liked that part. I followed it up with a critique of her process and that she liked less. In attentiveness, Atieno does not paint the face of the woman, only the face of the woman who sees her. Look again into the photographer's stunned face. Do you see awe, panic, Adoration in a single oval moor, in two glistening eyes, in a hand frantically clutching a camera strap. Do you believe cartoons are art? This painting is garish. It is clumsy. 
but it's so revealing of Artiano herself. I do not feel we can devalue its worth simply because it does not seem to show any skill. If Claudia were still alive and could hear what I am saying, she would never speak to me again. But she's dead and cannot hear what I am saying and will still never speak to me again, so what are you going to do? Three. Sunglasses and cigarettes. These are two men wearing sunglasses. They both hold cigarettes. Next to them is an unpleasant-looking dog. The five-button suit jackets these men are wearing are dissimilar to the conservative business fashion of council employees or the simple structure of police jackets. These men look quite different from usual police, even undercover officers. Artiano has also spent quite a bit of time on their mouths and hands. Notice the texture of her lines in these areas of the picture. Much more detail on their tight countenances and the tense physical postures. Their hands are clenched, cigarettes poking out of stone fists. Their lips curled, not in anger, but stern concentration. And unlike agents from the society establishment, they do not attempt to hide their observations of Artiano and her private home. States people who appeared at Artiano's home often tried to gather information, but in a sociable and subtle manner. These two men and their dog, a mixed breed similar looking to a Doberman Pinscher though, stand brazenly at the curb staring directly inside. Given the rectangular framing around this sketch, I believe Atiano drew this from the front window of an apartment she lived in years before I met her. It suggests she did not go outside to greet or confront them. I believe she was perhaps frightened, or at least dubious, of these men and their dog. Claudia socialised with many politicians of the new society, as well as other well-known artists and business owners. She wanted to be as important as her art. But the edges of these circles are contoured roughly with insidious people, people who do not trust nor like those within. These men and their unpleasant dog were from some place we should not want to know. Look at the way they stand and stare. Do you feel watched? What do you think they know about you? Who do you think they report to? Do you believe in conspiracies? Claudia did. I saw men like these once sitting at small tables on the footpath outside a small cafe in Cornwall. They watched me, smoking their cigarettes. I did not believe them to be anything other than well-dressed men with a bad habit and an unpleasant dog but Claudia was certain they were dangerous and covert operatives. I told Claudia if they were a threat, we should lay low, have fewer parties and get-togethers, but we did not. I don't know how strongly Claudia believed in her own stories. We had more parties with bigger, more important, more controversial people. Her then-lover, Pavel Zuboff, brought many friends who talked often of the new, new revolution. Nothing ever came of their bluster. But in an unstable new world, revolutions are not difficult. What happens after a revolution is another matter, of course. Within the Wires is brought to you by Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Blue Apron each week sends you fresh ingredients so you can make delicious food. You make it, you cook it, using their easy-to-follow recipes. And you can turn off the weeks you don't want them. So this past week, I've been on tour with Night Vale, and we just completed the inaugural PodCon in Seattle, so I'm not home to get any Blue Apron. So I just clicked skip for the weeks I was gone, and this weekend when I get home, Zowie. a box of fresh ingredients ready for me to cook up. In fact, I can go look on the website now to see what they're sending me. Holy sh- Spicy honey lime chicken tostadas with rice and beans. Son of a Chili butter steaks with lemon parmesan broccoli and potatoes. Fucking eight. They source their ingredients locally. And being a resident of the Hudson River Valley, I'm so excited about the delicious food I'm finally going to get at my home. 
this weekend. And every single fresh vegetable, meat, condiment, and seasoning will be sent in a secure refrigerated box. The only thing I need is olive oil, a range top, and a sense of culinary wonder. Also a dog. I want a dog. This is unrelated to Blue Apron. Please send me a dog. Blue Apron. You should own a dog. That's not their slogan, but it could be. Thanks, Blue Apron, for making me better at food. And thanks for supporting Within the Wires. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. This episode is also brought to you by The Shape of Water, a new movie from Fox Searchlight and visionary filmmaker Guillermo del Toro. Y'all, I love Del Toro, and I can't wait to get home from PodCon so I can watch this movie on a giant screen. You know who's in this movie? Sally Hawkins, Octavia Spencer, Michael Shannon, Richard Jenkins, Michael Stuhlbarg, Doug Jones. The Shape of Water is an otherworldly fable that is part love story, part espionage thriller, part fantasy, and 100% original, because of course it is, because it's Del Toro. My friends keep telling me this film is a stunning and beautiful cinematic vision. It won the Golden Lion for Best Film at the Venice Film Festival, and it's also 98% certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and you need to go see it in a cinema because it's Del Toro. So don't miss The Shape of Water, now playing in select theaters. And now, back to the O'Hara Museum of Art. Four. Lamp. Oil on wood. Of this particular era, of Atieno's life, during the height of her fame, this might be my favourite work, the type of work I encouraged in her, a piece which, when she finished it, I applauded and opened a vintage cabernet from Marlborough I'd been saving for such an occasion. Most of her paintings from this time pander to a broader pseudo-intellectual audience in search of strange, moderately confrontational art, a story they can tell others, a debate they can have over art's virtuosity and validity. They may say, this is not art, but that argument is the art itself. In Lamp, Claudia basically painted an inverted yellow V atop a brown circle on a flint background. It's geometric, to be sure, and part of a post-war revival of Art Deco, all of the evolutionary flourishes of Art Nouveau eradicated, however. Here we see only the effects of the lamp, an incandescent shine in the dark, but the actual architecture of the device is missing entirely. I spent a full 20 minutes raving to Claudia about this work when she showed it to me in 1969. We had not known each other long and our initial relationship was almost like a master and pupil. I could teach her nothing about the craft of visual arts. But we drank wine and talked late into the nights, for all of her political and refined small talk at parties with celebrities and power brokers, I was, I flatter myself, one of the few people she could really talk to. There was Pavel but their relationship was purely one of mutual and tumultuous passion for each other's bodies. Claudia's and my relationship was one of passion for creation. My praise of this painting, original in a way she had seemed incapable of, so bold but on the nose politically, went past her. I told her this. This is what she should be creating, not staplers or glorification of celebrity, not copies of other works. She put the painting away and later told me she destroyed it. When the staff at the O'Hara Museum told me they were showing this work, I flew to Japan just to see it again. I'm glad she did not destroy it. Look at its architecture, its balance, or how it's teetering slightly. It's not physically possible, this lamp, but every element is in harmony. Look at that shade of yellow, closely. How can a human make that colour? It almost makes me angry. Which brush strokes on this painting do you resent? Are they the same strokes you admire? I'd like to tell you that this is her finest work, but in the past few years, more tributes and derivatives of Lamp have multiplied throughout the modern society art movement. Her work seems to be a cheap replica of itself, rather than an original that inspired hundreds of copies. 
perhaps this painting's brilliance has been eclipsed by the works it instigated. Or perhaps I'm the wrong person to be narrating your walk through this exhibit. There are several other paintings I could describe to you, but I think after just a few you've got the idea. These works are decades old, and you've seen countless tributes or copies of them. You don't need me to tell you what a clear acrylic box full of acorns means. It honestly doesn't mean anything. Or rather, it means Claudia Artiano recognised that quantity was greater than quality, that celebrity simply means that demand surpasses supply. If she could keep generating new work, she could keep putting on exhibits all over the world, filling the needs of art-hungry survivors of a terrible war and its apocalyptic aftermath. 5. Box of Acorns Acrylic Box Acorns I already said you don't need to hear about this work, but oh, I don't know. <sighs> Perhaps you do need to hear about it. There was an oak tree on the island of her home in Cornwall, and she collected the acorns. I watched her do it. She found this acrylic box in a warehouse of post-war debris. I was with her that day, and we marvelled at the number of paintings and sculptures in that warehouse. I really didn't. I'll stop beeping in your ears. No, I won't. 11. There's not actually a painting 11, but I'll just go on the idea you forgot to press stop or you're curious to see how far I'll take this. I will tell you, though, that investigators found parts of Artiano's body two years ago. They weren't certain they were hers at first, Pieces of bone and clothing washed up on a lonely beach on St Agnes Island. Then this year they found teeth, and most of a torso, underneath several inches of mud along a rocky beach. The torso had pieces of clothing that matched their previous clothes. They knew from the torso that the body had fallen, been crushed by the hard slap of gravity. An eight-year-old girl found the body, the girl's attendant had to report the girl to retraining at the Institute. A, a place dedicating to ensuring that society's new precepts aren't disrupted. Not much is known about the Institute, and what is rumoured about them goes unproven, but... There is reason to be suspicious. There is reason to be more than suspicious. I'm positive that the scars of seeing human remains were less impactful than the scars of whatever... Recalibrating they're putting her through now. Or perhaps she didn't know what she found. Just a blue-grey mound of fetid biology, vaguely human-shaped, partially preserved in salt and mud. 
Maybe the girl could make out the outline of a person in this rotten flesh lump. Somehow that's even more frightening. Something that looks human but is not. Is not any more. Crushed. From a fall, they said. But it wasn't the fall that killed her. <laughs> She'd been falling for years. It was the rocks. Or something that she hit. I shouldn't just say rocks out loud. I never forgave her for slighting her legacy in favour of fame. But maybe I'm the one who needed to be forgiven. For demanding too much of her. For resenting her. <sighs> for adoring her. For lots of things. Teeth and a torso. <laughs> Someone should paint that. Oh, God, I'm sure you're going to want your money back from this audio tour. Tell the folks at the O'Hara that the tape player seemed broken. Or tell them that you didn't end up enjoying it. Don't tell them what I said. Or do, I don't care. I honestly don't. I loved Claudia. She was a gifted artist and giving friend. She had a period of work this museum seems to like, but which I find contemptible for its naked pandering. Maybe I'm just sad. I can't reconcile my feelings. <sighs> I can't believe they found her body. <sighs> I can't believe I don't get to tell anyone anymore that she's still alive. I probably knew she wasn't. But I could always tell myself she was. Bone fragments on a beach. Near a home for pre-teens. The first post-war generation to grow up without parents. The great experiment for a great new world. <sighs> I don't know. Within the Wires is written by Jeffrey Craner and Janina Mathewson and performed by Rima Tewiata with original music by Mary Epworth. Find more of Mary's music at maryepworth.com. The voice of Leah Akane was Julia Morizawa. Thank you to Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. And don't forget to check out the amazing Within the Wires t-shirts and Claudia Atiana art print at withinthewires.com. Okay, our time is done. It's you time now. Time to stop by the museum gift shop. Grab yourself a souvenir book of paintings about the sinus infection I have. Pick up a poster featuring me coughing and buy a commemorative vase made out of fake will. Hello. I seem to remember seeing Wim Ferros in 96 at the Community Harvest Festival. Did this actually happen, or am I just misremembering? All the best, Ken. That was probably him, Ken. Ken remembers Wim Ferros. Deirdre Gardner remembers Wim Ferros. Do you? It Makes a Sound, a new serial fiction podcast created by Jacqueline Landgraf. Every other Sunday on the Night Vale Presents Network. This has been a production of Night Vale Presents. Find out more about us and our shows at nightvalepresents.com.